And now to our closing speaker. Mr. Philip McAllister has been involved in the space industry for many years in many different roles. And currently he serves as the Director of Commercial Space Flight Development at NASA. In his closing keynote speech, he will speak about the future of commercial space markets with an emphasis on commercial human space flight. Please help me um, welcome Mr. Philip McAllister. Okay. All right. Thank you. I don't know what time it is. All right. So thanks everybody for still being here. This is the real diehards, right? It's six thirty. I can't believe you guys are still here. This is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're just still here because the reception's here, so or coming after me. So you're like, I might as well listen to McAllister speak, right? So anyway, uh, I will reward you. So for the people that are still here at the end of my talk, I will tell you who's going to win the next round of ICAP awards. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Jeff, don't tweet that, right? Don't tweet that. Not doing that. It's coming soon. You can quote me on that, that the awards are coming soon. All right, but thanks for showing up this late. I appreciate that. Uh, let's move on. The first thing that I want to say, let's see if this works. No, it doesn't work. Let's see. There we go. So here, who's here from SpaceX? Anybody still here from SpaceX? <laughs> yeah, right. Well done. Anybody from COTS? I see Dennis is here. How about the ISS program office? All those guys, big round of applause. This was an unbelievable mission. Way to go. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about commercial crew and then broadly about commercial space flight. Um, what's wrong? It's working. I just, oh, she's been clicking. All right, that's fine. Then it hasn't been working. That's really, OK. So anyway, the illusion, the illusion, that's right, it's very, it's very appropriate. Um, so anyway, what are we doing with commercial crew? Uh, certainly we are trying to close the gap, we are trying to get the U.S. back in the human space flight business as soon as possible, but we're also trying to enable this future vision. This is the one that I, I like to show uh, to remind us that it's not just about the tactical goals. Yes, we want to close the gap, we want to get the U.S. back in. Uh, into space. We want to end our reliance on foreign providers, make the space station more robust. I want to do all those things, all those tactical goals. But long term, the big vision that we try and keep in mind uh, at NASA is this vision. And I like the graphic because it shows space flight into more routine operations. It's also got the ISS up there, which is the key anchor for the commercial crew program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the future slide. Um, you're ahead of me, but that's okay. Uh, so, uh, but that is the key, a profit-making venture where we've got lots of providers and lots of users. So I use the word commercial a lot. So the question invariably comes up, what is commercial? I got the definitive answer, no, who cares? I'm done with that question, I'm tired of that question. No more about that question, please, right? It's, a, it's enough, it's just an academic question, I can't ever, uh, answer that definitively, it's going to work now, or you're just pretending she's still going to control it right now. Um, okay, I'll go like this and that'll be the trick. So I really don't want to debate this anymore. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah, there's a lot of components that go into a commercial-like approach, so I will talk about what I think it means at NASA. Next slide, yes. So this is the kinds of things that we're talking about at NASA when we talk about a commercial approach. It means a lot of different things to a lot of people. That's why I don't think the definition question really makes any sense, because it's never going to be the same for everybody. But at NASA, these are the things that we are trying to look for in our partnerships and commercial crew. Do you see the characteristics? No, nope, go back. You're still ahead of me there. Uh, who's the owner? In the early space age and beyond for Apollo and Skylab and even shuttle, NASA was the owner. We'd like to a more commercial oriented approach where industry is the owner. Contract type, cost plus versus fixed fee, a lot of discussion on that. Management, prime contractor versus a public private partnership. These are all components. You can go down the list. Uh, customer, who's the customer? If it's NASA only, 
I do think that's a more traditional approach and more appropriate for a more traditional approach, but if you've got the potential for non-NASTA customers, you might want to consider a more commercially oriented approach. Um, funding, NASA's role, requirements definition, and cost structure. I think this is a good thing to help orient everybody. It doesn't mean you need all of these things, but if you got all of these things, you pretty much have a commercially oriented approach. But if one of those doesn't apply, it doesn't mean you're not commercial, right? But these are the kinds of things that we're trying to get to at NASA. So I know many of you in the audience may be skeptical about NASA's ability to follow through on commercial crew. I understand that when you look sort of historically at some of the commercial initiatives that NASA has, uh, has been involved in, NASA's reaction historically to some commercial approaches have been like this. Please go to the videotape. You can't get any audio? No audio? No. 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 Hell no. 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 I refuse. No. <laughs> I love that clip. <laughs> so historically, sometimes that has been NASA's uh, reaction to some commercial initiatives. But you heard Dave Radzanowski this morning. We're knocking the doors down. We are doing things differently at NASA. Next slide. And I think this is a good slide to, to sort of explain it. If we were going to do commercial crew in a traditional uh, way, we would have extensive government involvement, no cost sharing. Government would own the IP. I think that's critical. You absolutely have to have that for a commercial approach. If, you, if the commercial entity does not own the IP, then I think that's, that's probably a non-starter right there. But these other things, detailed requirements, unlimited data, and generally higher cost. That overhead comes with the cost, uh, cost bogey associated with it. In a non-traditional approach, more limited in government involvement. We've got cost sharing. Commercial partner owns the IP. Tailored human rating requirements pay for performance milestones. You can see the list. That is the way we were doing the commercial crew. So I am, I am fairly confident that we can follow through on this. I think we set up the paradigm that's going to enable a more uh, commercial operation for this, while also giving NASA what it needs, which is ISS crew transportation. We want to accomplish both of those goals with this program. Next slide. One of the ways that we're doing this, just to give you a little bit more confidence that we can do this, is the way we're handling requirements. We are keeping them at what we call the level two, or the program level of requirements. We're not going down to the very, very detailed specs. Um, if you compare that to the shuttle program that had 10 to 12,000 requirements just at the level two, that doesn't even count the lower level vendors and subcontractors, um, you can see an order of magnitude difference. Now, COTS only had 320 in the visiting vehicle requirements, or 250, sorry, in the visiting vehicle requirements, but they only had to deal with what was happening with station when you came in that keep out zone. For crew, we're interested in the launch phase, the on orbit phase, when you get close to space station, and the deorbit phase. So I think 650, we're doing pretty good in the requirements area, but that doesn't mean you guys should just give us a pass. You should keep us uh, accountable for these things. But this is one of many areas that we're doing things differently with commercial crew. Okay, next slide. Okay, the takeaway for all this is very important. The, the reason that I'm contrasting these approaches is not to say one is good and one is bad. That is not the case. Each one of these approaches is appropriate for the kind of mission that you're, we're trying to do. If we're doing very ambitious, one-of-a-kind missions where NASA is the only customer, that is a more traditional approach. People were saying, why don't you do heavy lift uh, you know, commercially? I would say it's not appropriate. NASA's the only customer for that kind of um, throw weight, in my opinion, anytime soon. Uh, that still requires some very big technology, um, not developments, but technology accomplishments, for sure. We haven't built a vehicle that size since Saturn. It's going to be very, very difficult. Human spaceflight is also very difficult, but it's a mission that we've done over 100 times over the last 30, 40 years. So we feel like it is now time to sort of transition that more to the private sector. And I think by the combination of a contracting mechanism and this technical approach with requirements, keeping the amount of uh, government involvement down, pay for performance milestones, you put all that together, and I do believe that's going to um, um, enable a safe, reliable, and cost-effective. See, that's the key. I have no doubt that NASA can produce a safe and reliable space transportation system. The cost-effectiveness is going to be the difficult part, and that's where um, a lot of the discussions we have at NASA uh, uh, resonate from, but I think we can get there. Okay, next slide. So that's crew. Now I've got a few more minutes, uh, and my plan is to talk long enough so that I don't have to take any questions. Uh, it keeps me out of trouble. Um, 
So let's just move on to the sort of the more broader question of commercial uh, space in general. About a decade ago, maybe 12 years ago, I was with a company that um, was awarded a contract through Marshall for the second gen RLV program. It was part of the Space Launch Initiative. It was over a million dollars to do a 20 year launch forecast. Uh, global, worldwide, government and commercial markets. We got in a room, we, did 40, we had 42 markets defined. Some of them didn't make sense in 20 years and we pushed them out. But for every other one, we said, what's the real demand for commercial remote sensing data? What's the real demand for uh, telephony or internet services? And then we calculated that, figured out what the terrestrial competition was, and then figured out what portion was gonna go over satellite. Um, and then we translated that into launches and came through with, um, with a demand-based launch forecast uh, for, the in, for, the, for the world, actually, because it was worldwide for the next 20 years. So what did we come up with? Next slide. This was the results. We even had it broke down by small, medium, and large. I can't, heavy, I, I forget how we did that, some clever way. But you can see that it's pretty, pretty steady, right? It sort of meanders between 60 and 80, but there's no acute growth, growth trends. We looked at all this and you know, the terrestrial competition was where a lot of these markets fell down, space, solar power, there's a lot of demand for power. Uh, but when you take terrestrial competition in, the, the amount that could go over space that you need space for to actually close that business case becomes very difficult. So anyway, that was the key, uh, key takeaway for the ascent study that we did. We had that nice logo that was really cool, came up with a, an acronym. Um, but that was a real interesting message. So I thought about that when I was uh, thinking about my comments, and I'm like, you know, that was 10 years ago. We could actually check and see how well we did. So next slide. The baseline forecast was what you saw, but we also had another forecast. Whenever you're doing a forecast of 20 years, you have to make a lot of assumptions, right, about what's going to happen in the future. We said, you know, this is probably what we think is the most realistic, but there's another set of assumptions that are more uh, less optimistic about how fast the world economy was going to grow, how fast market saturation was going to be accomplished, how fast um, you, know, you could introduce a space, uh, a space capability and how that saturation would happen. If you took a more constrained case and said, you know, it might not happen that fast, this was the constrained forecast for the first 10 years. The total over that period was 718 global worldwide launch events for everything, government, commercial, total. So how do we do? Next slide. Pretty close. You notice, remember what happened? There was a telecom industry bust in the beginning part of the year. So you can see actually that little, little hump, um, trough and then sort of came back, right? So demand is still demand, but there wasn't enough credit. There wasn't enough risk taking. And then it sort of came back and, and uh, got back to where you would think at the end of that decade. So that was a 2.3% difference. We have a very technical term in the forecasting industry for when you make a 10-year forecast that that's close. It's called amazing. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was that close. What, is, what does that mean? Next slide. Uh, what that means is that unless something happens dramatically different with demand, we're going to see the next 10 years pretty much like the previous 10 years, which is pretty much in between 60 and 80 launches a year. What we need is more demand. I've asked, a lot of people have been asking me about these recent uh, announcements. These are all great. I love all these things. You've got the Strato Launcher. You've got Virgin Galactic announcing they're going to do small satellites. You've got NanoRacks, the Sentinel Project. All these things are great. We need more of those. But for the people here, and I wish the last audience was still here. I lost all the young people, or most of them. What my message is to you guys, next slide, we need more people doing things in space. We don't need more hardware. I mean, all this hardware is great. But if we really want to change uh, the equation and change what we think in terms of space, commercial space, government space, just the amount of space activity, we need people to be doing things, not supplying more hardware. That will come. If you have demand, the supply will come. And it's much easier being a customer than it is a supplier. Trust me. Uh, now that I'm in the government, I'm sort of in a customer role. That is a lot better than trying to sell something. So for those people in the audience, it's too late for me. Save yourselves. Go do something and be a customer. Come up with an app of, that's used using space-related data. 
or at least buy a ticket, right? George Whitesides will be real happy, or Lynx, buy a ticket on Lynx. I'm agnostic on this space flight vehicle, whichever one. Uh, but that, I think, can change that equation, can change that forecast from what we saw from just the regular you know, 60 to 80 launches. Then we could see something that would really maybe spike and see an, an acute growth trend and see this industry a lot bigger and this conference a lot bigger in the future years. That's it. Thank you. Did I waste enough time? Oh, five minutes to take questions. Uh, they're probably not going to serve the liquor till seven. So you got you for five more minutes. You might as well ask a question. And no, I'm not going to make the announcement on the awards, so don't ask. Yeah, Bruce. So, so Phil, since you opened this up, and, and my colleague Lynn Harper will be so happy that you said that last chart about demand side. She's been trying to, to, to pound this into us. She challenged us one time to go through a whole meeting and not mention launch vehicle once, <laughs> and we couldn't do it. That would be tough. That would be tough. So th the question there is, is what role does NASA have in, in supporting that demand side? You know, we used to have quite a good program in this area, and then you know, something happened. I don't quite remember what it was, but in the mid, the mid 2000s, you know, that a lot of those programs, especially in the life sciences, got whacked. Is does NASA, you know, do you think NASA has a role to play in, you know, helping with the development of that demand side um, economy? I would say very little. I'm not saying none, but I would say very little. And I'm talking about commercial demand non-government demand. I think what you're talking about was microgravity uses of the space station. We did have a lot of money in that, and we could see a, a potential budget uh, diversion for more of that in the future. Um, but in terms of creating commercial demand, I do not think that's NASA's role. I don't think that's really, I don't even think we would be successful in that. Um, but I do think there is a role for these public-private partnerships to enable space capabilities that may not necessarily exist when there is demand. Crew is a perfect example, right? We know that there is a market for non-NASA or non-government people to fly to space. That's been in existence since, since Tito flew in 2002. I was, uh, I was the li NASA liaison to the Executive Committee of Space, the Augustine Committee, um, and we had five companies came in with very credible plans that said, we would love to do this, but we cannot get, up, we cannot get enough of the upfront money to close this business case. So we came up with the commercial crew program, which mitigated their financial and technical risk. And now we've got a number of credible proposals. Uh, I'll just speak to CCDF2. CCDF2, we got 22 proposals, eight of which we carried into due diligence. It made me convinced that private industry could do this. But you just couldn't close the business case. So I think in that case, where you had a NASA need and a commercial demand, I think it made a lot of sense for the public-private partnership. Again, which is why I think these things are unique. You shouldn't just apply this model and say, let's just do everything commercially. Let's just apply COTS everywhere. COTS was great. It did, the, it did a great thing. It was super successful so far. Um, and I think there's a lot of those uh, applications that can go into crew and other areas, but not willy-nilly. We have to look at what we're trying to accomplish, and then you figure out how to do it. I hope that didn't get me in trouble with Lynn. Yeah, in the back. I just shout it out. I can hear you. I'll repeat it. I asked the question of uh, Mr. Adnowski earlier today. He could ask you. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Where is um, Dave? In the, in the previous round of CC Dev, you had uh, four funded, three unfunded, if I remember correctly. Yep, still do. Can you, uh, is there the potential to have unfunded, I mean, in theory, you can only have two or three funded act, act this, this round. Uh, is there the potential for unfunded uh, space act agreements this round? Sure. We are definitely open to unfunded uh, after this next round of CC Dev 2. I'm not saying we will do that, uh, but we're open to it. Um, so we, that's something the private industry has to decide for itself whether they want to come and approach NASA for an unfunded. Uh, but if there is somebody that wants to do something that's consistent with the ICAP announcement, 
then we can enter into an unfunded agreement, and we are definitely open for that. And the reason is, not only do we think that's a good thing, but there will be future phases of the commercial crew program. The ICAP program has a base period of 21 months, and then it even has optional milestones that will even go out to first crewed flight. There will be a certification phase, and that will definitely be done through a contract, and then there will be services in the future, and those are gonna be full and open competitions. So if they, somebody does not win uh, this current round, we do not wanna preclude them from future rounds, and uh, unfunded is a good way to go about doing that. Mark's comments at lunch were a great example of somebody who came in later and was successful even though the first couple rounds weren't. Good question. All right. Thank you very much.